here. Talk about hypertension. We'll probably jump into crisis as well, but um, hypertension is just such an important um, disease state in pharmacy and medicine in general that, you know, obviously we need to talk our way through it carefully. All right, hypertension. Um, when we talk about hypertension, it's really important to understand how prevalent uh, this disease is. Hypertension affects one in three adults in the United States, and it's uh, becoming one of the most common diseases among children um, after asthma. Uh, what that means is, is that you have people who are having high blood pressure, but may not be uh, managed for it correctly. So what we should do here is we should look at um, the, uh, the, there we go. That's what I want, the classific uh, classifications. Um, do you guys remember if she in class talked about the uh, ACC AHA guidelines or did she use the ISH guidelines? Do you remember, did she not talk about it? I guess a better way of saying it is, what is normal blood pressure? Less than 120 or less than 130? 130, okay, that's ISH. All right, so when we talk about hypertension, the first thing that we should really go into is the classification because it's uh, here that we are trying to um, look at what stage someone is in. First things first, normal blood pressure. So if you take three readings of someone and they have, uh, the, or sorry, if you take two readings of someone and they are elevated on two separate occasions, we have hypertension. So in other words, you have to have two readings at two different times. Why do we have to have this standard of two readings at two different times? Why is this important? Yeah, a blood pressure can fluctuate a lot. We don't know necessarily what's happening it's with someone at the first reading. Maybe they just walked up some stairs, so their blood pressure is elevated. Maybe they're very frightened of the doctor, right? So their blood pressure is going to be elevated anyways. Um, the, the, the biggest thing here is that having two readings at two different times gives us a pretty good idea of what that person's blood pressure is uh, as a true measure. If you take one value, you're unlikely to get a clear picture. Does it mean it's gonna be wrong? No, it just means that you might be putting uh, too much stock in um, a single reading, right? Um, normal blood pressure is less than 130 and less than 85, right? The other reading that um, you, depending on what she gives you, it could be less than 85, could be less than 80. Um, but she, oh, okay. So then she is following the ICE, the ACC AHA. Okay, 120 over 80. Ah, okay. All right, my bad. So normal blood pressure, less than 120, uh, less than 180. Big thing here to know is that uh, if someone has a, a, a blood pressure, they're, you know, they work out a lot, right? They are an athlete and they have a blood pressure of 130 over 90. Are we going to treat them for high blood pressure? Not necessarily. Right. So you have to take it in context of your patient that you can't just say like, oh, you're above 120 over 80. You have hypertension. We need to put you on a blood uh, diuretic. 
people who are actively working out more or, um, you know, maybe their anxiety is elevated when they go and see a doctor, right? They have white coat anxiety. Then we wouldn't necessarily be putting them on uh, a, um, uh, on blood pressure medication. If you have someone with white coat syndrome, you know, maybe you can get the nurse to go and take their blood pressure while they're sitting in the, uh, you know, in a, in an office or, you know, even out in the lobby sometimes. Uh, I've done that where I had a patient who was very, very uh, scared. So we had to take it while they were just sitting down. We actually brought them into the dental office. Elevated is when we are uh, getting above that 120 range, but specifically elevated is right under 130 and right under uh, 80. So we're seeing an increase in the systolic uh, systolic hypertension. And then once we get to above 130, this is where we have clinically relevant hypertension. All right. So we have normal blood pressure. We have elevated blood pressure, but it's not until that we are above 130 that we get actual hypertension. If you are less than 140 over 90, you are, oops, I'm not doing this right, stage one. Less than 140 over 90. And if you are even above that, uh, if you are above 140 or above 90, then we would consider you stage two. What's important to note is to have elevated blood pressure, you must uh, have both and, right? So you need to be 127 and uh, 84. That's elevated blood pressure. Okay. So if you have someone that is 118 over 86, this is not elevated. Okay. So normal blood pressure is an and statement. Elevated blood pressure is an and statement. You need both values to be out of range. Nope, 127, right? So in this case, the systolic blood pressure is fine, right? But the diastolic blood pressure is not good. But in this case, uh, this person has okay blood pressure because we need both of them. This is why I don't necessarily like writing it out like this. Uh, the way that I always think of it is less than 120 over 80, then 120 to 129, and then uh, less than 180, sorry, less than 80, right? So if you fall within this top range, then you are still okay. But if you fall above the diastolic, then uh, that would be too high. Once we go into clinically relevant hypertension, we have OR statements. So a bad blood pressure could be 137 over 82, or a bad blood pressure could be something like 121 over 93. Uh, or sorry, 86, for example. Either one of those could be bad. So to just write out these numbers a little bit more clearly, here we're talking about 131 to, uh, sorry, 130 to 139. And here we're talking about uh, 140 uh, to 150. If you're getting above 150, we're actually it's more like 160. Once you get about 160, we're kind of we're kind of getting concerned in a way. All right. 
So this idea of and or or is really important because if you have someone with uh, you know an elevated blood pressure, it, you know we can deal with an elevated blood pressure. Um, clinically relevant hypertension, though, um, that's when we start to uh, have a little bit of issue. When we talk about uh, blood pressure, what we should really be talking about here is the clinical features of blood pressure. And you're going to get this uh, question all the time is what does blood pressure feel like? What does high blood pressure feel like? It doesn't feel like anything, right? It's asymptomatic. It's a silent killer, right? What we care more about is really the complications of hypertension. And really, we only see this at the end stage, right? We see elevated blood pressures uh, over the course of decades. And that's where we start to get uh, issues. That being said, we do see some, some non-specific features. Um, this would be things like anxiety, right? The body is monitoring blood pressure when we are anxious or when we need to run away. Uh, we uh, have feelings of anxiety. And so if you ever feel like you know you are really anxious in a moment, but you don't know why, you just can't figure out a reason, it might be because your your heart is beating too fast. And so if you just breathe slowly, that will lower your blood pressure and will make you feel better. That's also why blowing into a paper bag uh, helps, it slows down your, your heart rate, makes you breathe, uh, lowers your blood pressure. Headaches, big, big, big part, you're putting pressure in the brain, right? Also, when you have changes in uh, the blood flow in the brain, you get things like dizziness, also, pressure in the ears can cause tinnitus, so which is ringing. So if you have a patient that's like, yeah, my my eyes, my ears are just been ringing constantly, they might have high blood pressure, right? Could be something else, um, but it might be. When we talk about the complications of high blood pressure, so this is decades and decades of issues what we're worried about is end organ damage. This vocabulary always confused me because I was like, is it the organ at the end of the process or is it is the damage at the end of your life? What is going on here? And it refers to the um, perfusion of blood over decades. So it's a time issue perfusion of blood to organs. And the way to think about this is that over time, if you have really, really high blood pressure, this is um, putting a lot of stress and resistance on those very small blood vessels in our organs. So what ends up happening is um, the blood vessels become less able to handle all that pressure, right? So in generally in the vasculature, right, around the body, you get things like um, claudation, which is, you know, clotting. Uh, you get peripheral vascular disease, meaning that the arteries are less able to, op you know, uh, vasodilate and vasoconstrict as much, right? they essentially get tired. The muscle is so weak trying to constrict against this really, really high pressure that it's not able to do it as much. And honestly, or uh, not honestly, what this leads to is sexual dysfunction, right? You, One of the big, big aspects of the uh, sexual organs is dilation and constriction to allow for blood to flow into the penile tissue and what ends up happening is that if you can't uh, constrict the veins but dilate the arteries in the penis, then you're unable to uh, form an erection. So that that's kind of a 
uh, it can end up being a really, really big issue um, that is not treatable at that point. In the eye, we end up with retinopathy. And does anybody know why retinopathy occurs because of high blood pressure? Yeah, you're you're kind of close, Walid. And yeah, you're 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 both really really close. Instead of a rupture, which would be hemorrhaging, what's going on here is that the increased bulging of the blood vessels puts pressure on the nerves. Right? So what's going on here is that it's um, the blood vessels are unable to really vasoconstrict. And so they get larger and larger and larger, and they're going to push all the tissue away from it, right? So what that's going to lead to is pressure. And then eventually it's going to uh, fuck up the arteries. The other thing that can happen here is, uh, sorry, fuck up the, the nerves in the eye. The other thing that can happen is so you have decreased blood flow which means that you have decreased nutrition to the nerves and uh, decreased uh, waste removal, right? So two pretty bad things. In the brain, big, big issue here is stroke and ischemia. Stroke, if you remember, is an occlusion. Essentially, what this means is that when the uh, blood vessels are not able to constrict and dilate as they need to, this doesn't allow for correct blood flow, and then you get a clot, and then you have a stroke, right? A, a myocardial infarction right, a clotting in the coronary artery is also, you know, it can be seen as a stroke, right? It has very, very similar uh, uh, issues that are going on. Um, the, da, 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 uh, ischemia, which is decreased oxygen, you know, you're, you end up having an ischemic attack meaning that a portion of the brain is not able to have blood flow. And then the two big ones that we should talk about is the heart, which ends up giving us coronary artery disease, heart failure, and uh, valvular issues. So I just want to spend some time really talking about this because this is going to inform a lot of the decisions that we're going to make with our drugs. So for coronary artery disease, what is that specifically? What is coronary artery disease? Does anybody know? Yeah, it, it, you very, very good points. Essentially, what happens is that you have that plaque buildup in the heart, uh, in the coronary artery. Remember, the coronary arteries are the, uh, the blood vessels that feed the heart tissue, the myocytes themselves. So what ends up happening is that as our blood vessels become uh, very, very stiff because of all that pressure. What can end up happening is that you have a clot from some sort of plaque 
uh, usually cholesterol, could be a couple of different things. And then of course, any kind of plaque buildup can eventually lead to an infarct, right? So a lack of blood flow is one of the major issues that can happen. The other thing that can come out of coronary artery disease is uh, heart failure. And just to make it really, really clear, when we think of CAD, what I want you to think of is a, a partial ischemic state. So we have decreased oxygen delivery to the heart. That's the big thing that we care about. Heart failure, as you have heard me describe many, many times, is when the heart becomes weak. And what ends up happening is that we get decreased heart rate, decreased force of contraction, and decreased uh, inotropy, dromotropy, and chronotropy. Dromotropy is, con no, we don't get issues with conduction velocity, uh, stroke volume. There we go, decreased stroke volume. Why does the heart become weak in blood pressure though? What is going on that's causing the heart to become weak? Yeah, exactly. Elevated blood pressure over time leads to elevated uh, afterload. Essentially, what ends up happening is that the heart is trying to push really hard against a brick wall, right? There's already so much pressure in the blood, uh, in, the, in the vessels, that now you're trying to force blood against that, and it uh, is really strenuous on the heart. Over time, the heart is able to deal with this, but we talked about when we went through the RAS, what was one of the uh, compensatory mechanisms that happens with the RAS system? So the kidneys detect that there's too much uh, blood pressure, or uh, the sorry, that the um, that the pushing capacity has gone down. So what do we get with the heart? Some sort of change that goes on. I'll give it to you guys. Cardiac remodeling, which ends up causing the heart to become stiff, right? It's almost like it's that scar tissue, exactly, right? So it's not really scar tissue, but the way that I like to think about it is that the heart has become so stressed out that in order to stop itself from just crumbling into a big mess, it has to support itself with the scar tissue. So of course, this is gonna make the, uh, the heart really stiff and rigid, and that's gonna decrease the function of the heart. And then the last thing here to really talk about is the valvular issues. When we talk about valvular issues, really what we're uh, focusing on is regurge, and uh, dissections. Regurge is where the blood slips backwards. So normally, once a beat happens, blood goes forward, and the wub dub of the heart is the valves sh slamming shut. But what ends up happening is that blood is able to slip through the valves because of the high pressure. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna mess up the correct blood flow for the heart. And this is where we lead to things like murmur. Once you have such high blood pressures, you can rip your, uh, your valves and you get things like aortic dissections. But that's really more of an issue with very, very, very high uh, blood pressures 
uh, for a short period of time, like in hypertensive crisis or medium high blood pressures for a longer time. Um, usually you have to have some sort of uh, already uh, instability going on in that sort of idea. And then finally, the last thing that I just want to talk about is in the kidney. In the kidney, one of the big things that happens is that you get uh, insufficiency. You end up getting a uh, proteinuria. So protein in the urine. And then eventually what uh, the this leads to is kidney failure. And we're going to talk about those uh, a little bit later on, uh, more specifically once we get into the drugs. But it's good to just complete our list so that we have we have it all available. Does this make sense? Any questions about this stuff? All right. Oop, did I? started halfway down the page. All right, let's get into our treatments. The goal of hypertension treatment is primarily what? What is the primary goal of treating hypertension? There we go. Decrease risk, decrease mortality, decrease morbidity. That is the first goal. The second goal is decrease blood pressure. Why is the first goal to prevent mortality and morbidity? Why are we not just trying to reduce blood pressure overall? Right. The big thing here is that we're trying to prevent end organ damage, EOD. If we just lower blood pressure, we may not be, yes, we're going to be treating a value, but we're not uh, necessarily getting to increasing mortality, increasing morbidity, right? In other words, just because you're lowering someone's blood pressure, doesn't mean that their heart is necessarily going to get better, right? Or their kidney is suddenly going to get better. We have to be careful of what our uh, treatment is. When we talk about lowering the blood pressure, what is our uh, focus, our, our, our first focus when we get to lowering blood pressure? Right, lowering the blood pressure without lowering mortality and morbidity can cause death. Yeah, so our goal here is um, we want to get below 140 over 90, right? That's our primary goal. For a lot of people, we're going to push that even lower to 130 over 80. And this is where we, we start to see a kind of uh, selective uh, goal, right? Sometimes some people, it's better to give them a strict goal while well, other people might need a more relaxed goal. And we'll talk about that in a second. But the primary thing that we want to uh, think of is we want to manage side effects, right? As little side effects as possible. And then the other thing, which isn't so important nowadays, but we wanna make sure that cost is being uh, thought of, right? So we want to achieve our goal, but we don't want to make it so unbelievably unbearable in order to have that be done uh, to just accomplish getting a number, right? If we cause someone to cough constantly, it doesn't matter how much you tell them that their eyes will go away, they won't do it.
everyone it's the one thing that everyone always remembers ACE inhibitors are cough 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 not oh, non non farm not non treatment all right i'm going to show you a fantastic uh little guide on how to reduce uh blood pressure This is information that I give my patients. It is uh, honestly some of the uh, best information that you can give people. First things first, reducing weight. What is the target? Let's actually do it as a chart. So we have our parameter. We have our target. And we have our blood pressure reduction. Here we go, me not being able to draw in straight lines. All right, reducing weight. When we talk about uh, reducing weight, this line is going to bother me. Much better. What we are talking about here is getting to the ideal body weight, right? When you talk to someone about losing weight, it is important to give them a goal to get to, right? Just saying, oh, you need to lose weight doesn't actually give them anything to work towards. They know they need to lose weight, but giving them a goal that says, oh, we need to get your BMI to 20, or we need to get your weight down to so many pounds. That is something that they can work on. Generally, you get one millimeter of mercury, uh, lower, uh, one millimeter of mercury per kilogram lost, right? So if someone is 130 over 90, you can lose 10 pounds and get your blood pressure back down. Pretty nuts, right? In terms of diet, the DASH diet can be pretty effective. Does anybody know what the DASH diet stands for? This is also a question I definitely remember from my exam. Dietary, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. So what's our target here? When someone's on a DASH diet, what are they trying to get to? What are we trying to give them? <laughs> our diet should be mostly fruits, veggies, whole grains, so not even rice. You're not supposed to have rice. And then low in saturated and trans fats. If you can accomplish a DASH diet where two of your three meals a day follow the DASH diet, that is a reduction in 11 millimeters of mercury right off the bat. Decreasing dietary sodium. What is our goal for... Uh, dietary sodium, less than what? This is a very important number that you should do, that you should know. 1,500. Make sure you know this number. All right? Uh, just sticking to this 
is five to six millimeters of mercury. Increasing your dietary potassium, where we're focusing on three and a half to five grams per day without going over it, because sometimes uh, you can, which is this is mostly happening through fruit and veggies, right? I'm not talking about someone should get a potassium supplement, is a reduction in four to five. Uh, decreasing alcohol, um, where for, uh, males is less than two standard drinks a day. And for women, it's less than one standard drinks a day. This is a reduction at about four. You can get drunk, feel free. You have my permission. All right, last things to, to go over, aerobic exercise. Aerobic exercise is 90 to 150 minutes per week. five to eight, non-aerobic, same goal, 90 to 150 minutes, four millimeters of mercury. And then finally, isometric resistance. Does anybody know what this is, isometric resistance? Yeah, it, it's kind of like weights or the band. Uh, it could be hand grip exercises, stretching. Um, non uh, Yoga would go under non-aerobic. Um, at least three sessions a week, uh, five millimeters of mercury. So when you are talking to patients, I often give them this chart. And I say, pick three. Right? What is three things that you think you can accomplish? And by giving them these this table, you're much more likely to have them be compliant with these lifestyle modifications. Right? In class, she gives you this list, right? She gives you, oh yeah, weight loss, dash diet, uh, increase your exercise, right? Those are the the big things. But giving them this table of goals, is something that they can look at and actually accomplish. Um, I have used it with many, many, many people, and it is incredibly, incredibly helpful. Any questions about this stuff? Yes. Oh, perfect. We will definitely be taking a look at those. All right. First line treatment. Okay. We have three first line categories. What is our three uh, first line? What is one of the, the first line groups? Boom. First line, ACE inhibitor. If you can't do ACE, you go to ARB. Second group, calcium channel blockers. Very nice. Diuretics. Usually we prefer thiazides 
in hypertension and then go to loop if we need to. So this is your broad overview. What I want you to know is that if you have a treatment naive person, meaning that if you have someone who has not been started on a uh, on any pharmacological treatment, this is where you choose from, okay? If you have class one, you're gonna choose one. If you have class one or, uh, sorry, class two or class one with core morbidities, your initial treatment is going to be two. What that means is, is that you choose one drug from each of the three main categories. You choose an ACE and a thiazide, right? So you do your lisinopril and you do your hydrochlorothiazide, or you do your valsartan and your hydrochlorothiazide. You're thinking of Schnee. While ASCVD risk is important, uh, that's not necessarily a component of hypertension because that's more about uh, lipids, is ASCVD. All right, let's talk through these. ACE and ARBs. Uh, obviously, don't get me wrong, you know, where are you gonna be using these? Hypertension, right? We wouldn't be talking about these uh, if, we weren't, if we weren't using them in hypertension. What these are also, so they're all indicated for hypertension. But ACE inhibitors, specifically, and ARBs as well, are nephroprotective. So what disease states are going to be best uh, for someone to, if you had to choose one drug, what disease state would you maybe want to choose an ACE over a diuretic or a calcium channel blocker? Kidney disease, 100%. Renal disease in some case. What else? One really, really, really big category of people. Kidney failure, yep. That would be included here. Diabetics, very nice. Diabetics, because one of the progression points of diabetes is uh, chronic kidney disease, right? So if someone is going to be adherent to their blood pressure, but maybe they're not going to be very good about managing their diabetes, we can at least prevent additional damage uh, by uh, having this. The other one is if someone has significant albuminuria, which often you will find because of diabetes, uh, albuminuria is an indication that the uh, kidneys are damaged, right? Albumin is a very, very, very large protein so if we are finding albumin in your urine, that means that your kidneys are damaged and we need to uh, protect them as much as possible. Does that make sense? Any questions about that sort of stuff? All right. In terms of diuretics, this is the preferred treatment. So if you don't have, if you have your most basic of basic patients, you just start a diuretic. You don't really start with ACE. You don't really start with calcium channel blockers. If you just have a 40-year-old patient uh, who doesn't, you know, who eats too much salt and they drink a lot, you know, this is where you would start, right? 
Uh, additionally, to know about this sort of stuff is that it is um, the uh, the initial treatment in uh, elevated systolic blood pressure. Does she? Does she have a CVD risk? Oh, I see what she's saying. It that's because if you um I see what she's saying. Okay, yes. We'll talk about it. Did she explain ASCVD in her PowerPoint or did she um or was that Schnee? Because I'm pretty sure that's Schnee. A little? Okay. I'll explain ASCVD. Um Ah, okay. I see. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. <laughs> All right. With diuretics, um, if someone just has elevated uh, systolic blood pressure, you're going to be using a uh, diuretic, right? If it's just elevated blood pressure, diuretics are a great first choice. They're also a first choice in uh, black patients. They're one of the best options. And then finally, when we talk about the calcium channel blockers, the first line is the non-DHPs and the secondary, uh, nope, whoops. I put that backwards. I was literally thinking of the right drug. First choice is the DHPs, and then second choice is the non-DHPs. Does anybody know why the DHPs are preferred over the non-DHPs? Right. They're just affecting the blood vessels without affecting the heart, right? They only work on the blood vessels. Uh, the primary one that we are going to be choosing is amlodipine. And really, um, what I would say is that DHPs will follow this sort of idea up here, whereas non-DHPs are very uncommon. Okay, so when you're looking for the parameters of like amlodipine, refer to the diuretics. Okay. Um, very quickly, I just want to do another, the overview of, was this helpful to go through this overview like this? Okay, I figure this is the stuff that you guys want to see rather than me like going drug by drug, you know, at this point, I think you just want like to know how to approach things uh, rather than, you know, specifics. We will go through some specific things, but, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. All right, let's look at second line options. When we look at the second line options here, it's not, uh, it's that it's because I've been um, I, I've been where you guys are. <laughs> you know, I, I I was there, you know, only two years ago. So when we talk about second line, we're not talking about, oh, you try an ACE inhibitor and it's not working, so now you have to use a second line drug. What we're talking about is you use an ACE inhibitor, you add a diuretic, and you're still not at goal. Okay. So the second line is when you have a first line and a first line, but you're still 20 over 10 from goal. Okay, 
So you have your ACE inhibitor and you have your uh, diuretic, but you're still not responding, okay? Before you start a second agent, a second line agent, you must assess what? What is incredibly important uh, before you start a new drug? Uh, nope, you don't even have to do a blood test. Compliance, exactly. You have to look at adherence, okay? Very, 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 very important. The reason for this is, is that you have someone on an ACE inhibitor, they say, you know, they come back for their three month follow up, it's not working. So you increase the dose. They come back three months later, it's not working. You add a diuretic, it's still not working. If you don't take the drug, it has a bioavailability of zero, right? So this is what ends up happening is that you keep prescribing new drugs, upping doses, and then eventually someone sees something on TV, they get really, really scared. And then they take their very high dose multi polypharmacy drugs, and then they get hypotension, fall down the stairs and crack their head open, right? So you really, really, really have to um, assess for adherence before you increase doses uh, or you add other drugs, all right? And it's just as simple as tell me how you take this drug, right? That is... Uh, and be honest with them. Say like, I don't want to increase this drug if you're not taking it. Just be honest with me. I'm not going to be upset. That That's really all you have to say. All right. Beta blockers. Uh, when we talk about the beta blockers, we have a few different categories. Okay. We have our alpha and beta non-selective. We have our non-cardio selective, and we have our cardio selective. What are some examples of our alpha, beta, non-selective? What are some drugs we remember that also have some effect on alpha and beta? Labetalol, carvedilol, very nice. What about our non-cardio selective? Which ones are not going to affect the heart? Affect the heart as much, I should say. Mm, st stay with the beta blockers. Propranolol, natalol, there's others as well. Pindolol, yep, pindolol is another one. But when we talk about non-cardio selective, we're talking about non-selective beta blockers, right? Because these drugs are going to have an effect on what? What structure are they going to be affecting? The blood vessels exactly right so the reason why you know from decreasing choice and again we're talking about best in hypertension only right is that we have alpha which is going to be working on the blood vessels right? Blood vessels. Non-cardio selective is going to be beta 2, which is our blood vessels. But our cardio selective are only going to be working on our blood vessels, right? So these are all the drugs that you guys love shouting about, right? Atenolol, bisoprolol, manbaba, exactly. And here I am trying to write metoprolol, but you guys are making me write man babe. 
right? So if you had to choose a beta blocker, choose ones that are going to have effects on the blood vessels rather than the heart, okay? Does that make sense? Does anybody have questions about what they're used in or why we choose them? Okay. When we talk about these drugs, they have lots of advantages in comorbidities, right? So the comorbidities that we're going to be focusing on, comorbidity, are what? What kind of uh, conditions are we going to be choosing a beta blocker for? Heart issues, exactly. We would prefer a beta blocker when we're talking about heart problems, right? So we're talking about ischemia of the heart, ischemic heart disease. Right? We're talking about heart failure, AFib, uh, um, aortic dissection, and other valve valvular problems, right? Things that have to do with the heart. Alternatively, there's a couple of other areas where these drugs come in specifically in migraines and essential tremor. Really where these are coming in is their effect of um, with the throbbing and pulsating uh, in the brain or in, uh, in yes, in the brain, arrhythmia. Um, that's really what we're, we're focusing on, on with the migraines and the, two, and the tremor. But really what you guys should be focusing on is the heart stuff, right? Uh, disadvantages would be what? What would be some of the disadvantages of using the beta blockers? Yeah, so beta-1 blockade is, uh, well, if you have any kind of vasodilation, you're going to end up with reflex tachy, right? So any vasodilation anywhere in the body is going to cause reflex tachy. Um, but really, the beta-1 blockade, if it can lead to uh, decreased heart function, Right, and so this can um, uh, essentially cause like a uh, uh, I don't want to say worsening heart failure, but more I think that's probably the best way to put it. Right, is that if you're going to be slowing down the heart, right? The other thing too is that you're going to have a bradyarrhythmia. Likewise, you have some toxicity issues. Uh, the effect in other places in the body, like bronchospasm, right? So what can you uh, not give these drugs for? Who would be a bad person to give these drugs? Asthmatics, exactly. So that's a huge population of people you can't give that to. Likewise, like someone said, uh, hypoglycemia, so diabetics, you have to be careful with. Any questions about uh, beta blockers?
after the beta blockers are the other diuretics. The reason why we uh the reason why we talk about them like this is because often if your um first line isn't working, it's because we need some sort of effect on slowing down the heart. That being said, maybe we just need to reduce uh, the load on the heart, right? We need to diurese you more. In that case, we would be looking at the loop diuretics. So the, the way to think about this is that you've already tried a thiazide. Now we're going on to loop, OK? The loop diuretics um, are no, it's I I really shouldn't have written them up here. They're, they're really second line, but I just wanted to illustrate that first you start with the thiazides, then you move on to the loop diuretics. Same thing here, like DHPs are first line, and the non DHPs are second line, really, if that makes sense. It's a good question. Um. These are strong diuretics, OK? Why don't we use them first line? Why would these not, if they're very, very strong diuretics, why not just use them right from the get-go? Exactly. Tons of adverse drug reactions, OK? We tend not to give people the strongest drugs, uh, even if they work the best, because they generally have the worst side effects. Because of this, we see things like uh, hypokalemia, which leads to uh, arrhythmia. Tons and tons of different things can end up happening. You can really, really, really hurt someone. Um, they're annoying is the way to phrase them. Does anybody know why diuretics, loop diuretics specifically are considered annoying? It's because you pee all the time. You're constantly peeing all the time. So if you were to give a loop diuretic, at what time of day should someone be taking it? When should someone take their loop diuretic? In the morning. The reason for this is if someone takes their furosemide at night, they're going to be getting up within an hour to go pee. And then they're going to get up every hour after that to have to pee. All right. So one of the easiest uh, recommendations and interventions you can make is moving that diuretic to the morning. If someone has to take a BID, when should they take their second dose? Afternoon. Right. They should take it by by dinner time, really. That so that way there's at least a few hours of them peeing while they're still awake before they uh, uh, go to bed. That's really the biggest thing. The advantage of these drugs, and again we're talking about in comorbidities, is in chronic kidney disease, right? The, when the, the EGFR, the filtrating ability of the kidney is low, these drugs uh, help boost the kidney's function, right? So loop diuretics, very, very good for uh, kidney failure where your kidney is not uh, working also in heart failure. So in both of these situations, if you have someone with heart failure and hypertension, you're going to go right to 
loop diuretic. If you have heart failure and hypertension, you're going right to a loop diuretic. Uh, moving along, and then we'll talk about kind of drawbacks in a second. The aldosterone, uh, I'll just put them under potassium sparing. Because really, they're going to both do the same thing. Um, maybe I'll split them apart. Where we separate them is we have steroidal potassium sparing, right? Which, what are our two steroidal ones? Spironolactone and a plerinone. Plerinone's not. Uh, used very often. Aldactone is spironolactone, I believe. And then we have our uh, our uh, ENAS inhibitors. So this would be our amiloride and our triamterene. The reason why I'm splitting them apart is because our steroidal drugs are, um, their advantage is in hypertension due to hyperaldosteronemia. Right? So one of the big, big uses of using spironolactone and plerinone is if for some reason you have too much aldosterone, right? Where we will often see these more commonly used is an adjunct to other diuretics. Why are we going to use spironolactone and plerinone uh, as an adjunct. Right. We're going to raise the potassium. Same thing with our ENAS inhibitors. Really, we're just using this as an adjunct. So when should you choose a potassium sparing diuretic? You're going to choose the these diuretics when you need to increase your diuresis. Uh oh, sorry. Let me put it this way. You still have uh, you're above goal. Let me put it that way. You're above your hypertension goal, and you need to increase diuresis. So what I'm trying to say here is that you have someone who uh, you want to put them on a loop diuretic, but you're too worried about their low potassium right? Maybe they're chronically low. So you look at your patient case and their potassium is always right on the edge of being uh, below range. Well, in that case, we wouldn't want to increase their your hydrochlorothiazide that they're already on. Maybe we want to just add a potassium sparing, right? So the role of this is we're still not at goal, but we want to have more diuresis. Right. 
So oftentimes what you'll see these come in is that you're at max dose of your diuretic. And so we add a, a potassium sparing. So max dose plus potassium sparing. Why they cause hypokalemia? Uh, I would think they would cause hyperkalemia. Uh, maybe he just misspoke. Um, that's the only thing I can think of. I mean, I I can look into it, but the they're they're gonna raise potassium levels. All right, alpha blockers. When we look at our alpha blockers, primarily prezosin and doxazosin, um, what the first question is, why are we using these drugs? What is their ability here? Uh, What are alpha blockers doing? Exactly. They're causing vasodilation. So essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to widen the arteries here. Their really only use, their indication is pretty uh, meager. They're not very common anymore. They're not really a good choice anymore. Um, purely because we just have better drugs, but we're going to be using them in pheochromocytoma, which is that tumor of the adrenal gland where we're getting too much release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. So it's gonna block the effect of, of those uh, uh, neurotransmitters. And then where what's the other main disease state that we're gonna be using these drugs? BPH. So what's really the only time that, you know, you put a patient on an ACE inhibitor, it doesn't work, you add a diuretic, still doesn't work, and now you need to check, choose a second line. What disease state are you going to be choosing prazosin to add over like a, a beta blocker or something is if they have BPH, right? So if on the exam you see that you have a uh, a resistant hypertension with BPH, you're going to be choosing your alpha blocker. Okay, that's really where they come in. Um, otherwise, they uh, don't they don't really do much. They're very very weak in what they do. How common is a uh, or... It's more common than you think. Um, it it's like eight eight out of every million people or something like that. <laughs> it's like no, I think it's like one in every twenty five hundred people. Yeah, one in every twenty five people. Twenty five hundred people, I should say. Um, have I ever seen clonidine used in hypertension? Not for hypertension alone. I've seen, well, actually, let's get into it. Let's talk about the alpha agonists. It, pheochromocytoma doesn't necessarily need to be like cancerous tumor. It can just be that the adrenal gland is growing like the, it can be a benign tumor, but even benign tumors can cause issues because they, they're, you know, they're, it's more tissue that's going to be doing what tissue does. Um, when next year, when you guys get into cancers, it'll make more sense. Clonidine, uh, methyl dopa, although rarely, rarely methyl dopa um 
these are decreasing the alpha one stimulation, right? So same thing, they're gonna end up causing vasodilation. So have I ever seen clonidine being used primarily for blood pressure? No. Where, does anybody know where clonidine comes in? Where do we use clonidine really? I, I use it all the time in my patients, in my population. Anxiety. Anxiety specifically because again, remember that when you have increased blood pressure without a cause, right? So if you are sitting very calmly in a room and you have high blood pressure, right? That is gonna cause your anxiety to go wild. The brain interprets this high blood pressure as like, what, what happened? Like, are, are we supposed to be running right now? There must be something wrong. I must have to go and, you know, cause some sort of issue. A bear is probably gonna attack me right now. So clonidine is used because it's able to um, reduce that kind of activity in the brain and kind of calm that person down. This is also why propranolol can be used in um, in uh, anxiety as well. So propranolol and clonidine have a crossover into anxiety because of that effect uh, in the brain. All right, last section here. direct arteriodilators. Here we're talking about hydralazine and uh, minoxidil. And really um, there's really only two reasons why we would be using these drugs. First one is you have a pregnant patient. Uh, hydralazine is the preferred drug in pregnancy. Write that down, write that down. The other thing is that Bidil, the combination Bidil, is first line in black patients. Does anybody know what uh, uh, Bidale is? Let me see if I can. I always like to show this thing. Oops, I think I had to go into Micromedics, that's why. One moment. All right, just like you guys said, hydralazine and isorcibide dinitrate. What's really interesting, can you guys see this screen that popped up? Okay. This is one of the first drugs that was got an FDA indication for a race group. This was found to be incredibly effective specifically in black patients. So when they studied uh, Bidil specifically, they found that black patients have a much, much, much 
better response than white patients or other racial groups. So I always like to point out this fact that if you're looking for a second line drug for black patients, Bidil is a good option. Does that make sense? So I always like to point out this fact because it is, um, uh, it's it's important, right? To talk about these sorts of things. All right, any questions about this overview? Hydralazine is for pregnant women. So if you have a pregnant patient, just give hydralazine, not minoxidil. Minoxidil can work, it just hasn't been studied. All right, uh, on this exam, do you have, um, is heart failure on this exam? No, okay. Uh, Black patients in general. Black patients in general, not necessarily pregnant. Uh, don't give nitrates in pregnant patients, though. Uh, oh, I, I have it up. Um, I just want to see if going into this next part would be helpful. Um, I think it would be. Yeah. I think you guys would want to see it. Um, 8.30. Uh, I'll post it on, on the classroom instead. It's just a chart that goes through, like, based on what comorbidity, what should you choose? Um, but I'll just post that on the classroom because I'd rather get hypertensive crisis done. Um, just because uh, we can get that all done. All right, let's go into hypertensive crisis real quick. We might run over very, very slightly, but I hope not. Uh, let me bring up my... Notes. There we go. All right, hypertensive crisis. What's important to know about a uh, hypertensive crisis is, oh, are you really gonna make me do this? Oh, all right, one moment. Um, I really should just buy an account for this, shouldn't I? Um, I don't see any snow flurries outside, but I'm also on the opposite side of the state from you. Yeah, it was really bad. Okay, there we go. I got it. All right. Hypertensive crisis. When we talk about crisis, we have to talk about the difference between urgency and emergency. For both of them, or actually, um, let me put it this way. What is the, uh, we'll do this as a chart. I think that will be more helpful. Urgency, 
and emergency. In urgency, what is the blood pressure uh, in order for it to be considered urgency? Or emergency? What do you guys remember about the blood pressure requirement for emergency? Uh, 240 is a little bit high. Essentially what it is, is that for urgency, you have a blood pressure that's 180 over 120 without signs of end organ damage. Okay, so essentially what this is, is that you have uh, someone walk into your uh, office and they end up having, um, you know, you take their blood pressure and it's either 180, above 180 or above 120, right? So this is an or statement. If they walk into your office and they don't have any uh, signs of anything going on, this would be urgency. If you have a blood pressure above 180 and above 120 with end organ damage, that's emergency. Okay. Both of them are considered hypertensive crisis. But the difference between urgency and emergency is uh, how much time we have in order to uh, cause um, to fix the issue, I guess is the way to, to phrase it. I don't know why I did this chart. I really shouldn't have. When we talk about signs and symptoms, and this is uh, generally for both of them, I shouldn't have done a chart. What signs and symptoms are we going to see is a uh, focusing on bursting blood vessels. All right, that's really where we have an issue. If we see things like epistaxis, which does anybody know what epistaxis is? Oh, actually, you know what? These are divided by by type. My bad. I sorry. I'm all over the place. Oops. We are going to use this chart. Sorry. In urgency, we're going to see things like epistaxis, which is a nosebleed. Headache insomnia, and restlessness. By the time that we're getting into emergency, where we start to see actual signs of end organ damage, essentially we're taking these signs and symptoms and uh, tr like cranking it to the max, all right? So instead of just having a little nosebleed because you had a blood vessel pop in your nose or a headache because your blood vessels are swelling, you are going to have an intracranial hemorrhage. Or you are going to have a stroke. Or your eyes are going to bleed. You have a retinal hemorrhage. So you know in the movies where like someone starts to bleed from their eyes, it's because of like hypertensive crisis, right? On the heart, we're gonna see things like MI. Often we see aortic dissection is definitely one of the things I would say is your more common. And then of course, renal failure. Okay. Um, the big thing here is that with emergency, 
you have very, very small amount of time to fix the issue. But we can't just uh, we can't just dive into a treatment. We have to be careful about how we do it. Um, when we talk about causes of hypertensive crisis, what do we think could be causing this elevation in blood pressure? What are some of the causes potentially? Um, stress and uncontrolled diabetes are going to get you into pretty high blood pressure, but I wouldn't say it would get you to crisis. Phaochromocytoma, definitely, right? The body is releasing too much epinephrine, which is going to raise heart rate, raise blood pressure. Um, the uh, condition eclampsia, which happens to pregnant women, preeclampsia as well, head trauma, right? The brain's ability to regulate blood pressure gets out of whack. And so it starts telling the adrenal gland, oh yeah, keep, keep releasing epinephrine. It'll be fine. More often than not, it is drug related. What are some drugs we can think of that might result in a uh, hypertensive crisis if you were to overdose on them, say? Yeah, so drugs that increase blood pressure, right? non-adherence to anti-hypertensive treatment. And drugs that increase uh, neurotransmitters. Did she give you drugs by any chance? Not necessarily. Just to point out a couple. Um, drugs that increase uh, blood pressure, at least in my field, all the time is stimulants. So cocaine, amphetamines. It can also be things that um, make hypertension worse. So things like uh, MAO inhibitors. Likewise, overdosing on NSAIDs. The reason why for NSAIDs is because they uh, may, they cause kidney failure, right? And the kidney failure can result in, um, uh, uh, you know, you're you're unable to get the blood volume out, so that means that your your blood pressure increases rapidly. Non-adherence could generally be like you're supposed to be taking your lisinopril and you don't, and you're you know you have really bad blood pressure, but also specifically clonidine withdrawal. Clonidine is one of those medications that when you were taking it at doses for uh, blood pressure, forgetting to take it can cause a rebound effect that could be really, really, really bad. And then finally, drugs that increase neurotransmitters are things like overdosing on SSRIs, uh, the uh, tricyclic amine antidepressants, SNRIs, monoamine inhibitors. different stuff like that. So lots and lots of different uh, causes here.
All right. Let's get into treatment real quick. It's very, very simple. What is the treatment for hypertensive emergency? What are we going to do if someone is found to be urgent? Right. If they are asymptomatic, meaning that they walk into your clinic, you take their blood pressure, and they happen to be over uh, 180, over 120, if they're completely asymptomatic, start hypertensive therapy. Get them on uh, a quick-acting drug uh, and get that into their body. If they have nonspecific symptoms, right? So I'm talking about like the epistaxis or they have headache or they're dizzy and they have that really, really high blood pressure, put them in a chair, get them to rest If they're still elevated, then we're going to be doing a rapid acting treatment. In this case, it would be, uh, we're not following the regular hypertension uh, algorithm. We're just trying to get that blood pressure to go down. So this would be clonidine, uh, captopril, labetalol, and uh, God, what's the last one? Prezosin. You can use Esmolol. Um, although I, I, I don't, I don't know if Esmolol technically gets used a lot. I don't think so. If your patient has signs of end organ damage, you are in emergency. If you find that your patient comes into your clinic and they come, they are emergent, they have hypertensive emergency, where should you send them? I see you. Immediately you were going to send them to the hospital. This is not the kind of thing you can treat in an outpatient setting. The goal of um, treating hypertensive emergency is in the first hour, we are reducing the blood pressure maximum by 25%. Why do we want to maximum uh, reduce the blood pressure? Why not just try to slam it down so they don't die? Why would they die? You guys are close. It would drop the the too low pressure in the brain and the coronary arteries. So if you dropped it too quickly, then you wouldn't be getting blood to the brain and you wouldn't be getting blood to the heart, which means that you were going to uh, kill the patient. That's why they die, because they don't have perfusion to those uh, very, very important organs. In the next six hours, we are getting to a blood pressure of 160 over 100. And then finally, around 24 hours, 
we're getting to normal blood pressure. All right. Uh, da, da, da. Did she talk about special goals, like when to use nitroprusside or like what to do in aortic dissection? That sort of thing. She did. Okay. Specific goals. If your patient walks in with aortic dissection, meaning that they're uh, their aorta is literally being torn in half. Do we want to just reduce blood pressure by 25%? No. If someone has aortic dissection, in the first hour, we need to get their blood pressure down to 120 over 80. Uh, it's actually just less than 120. We need to get that out, right? Why, why do we want to drop the blood pressure so quickly? If we just talked about how dangerous it was to lower it too quickly, exactly. If you don't, if it's already tearing at such a high pressure, taking a slower approach is going to mean that you are. Uh, going to allow the heart to rip itself in half. Not good. In pregnant patients with that condition, eclampsia, our first hour goal uh, is a blood pressure less than 140. Why less than 140? So eclampsia is a condition that affects pregnant women. So why are we lowering the target? What's the danger of keeping it where it is? Mm, yes, bleeding is an issue, but what do we need to consider the health of? The baby, exactly. Keeping the blood pressure too high will keep will kill the baby. For people who don't know, eclampsia is when your blood pressure is so high you have seizures, or at least seizures are present. Whereas preeclampsia is uh, more about like end organ damage. Either one of these: severe eclampsia, severe preeclampsia they're both going to cause issues. They're going to kill the baby, essentially. Not great. All right. Uh, da, da, da. Okay. Drug choice. In uh. In general, are we using IV or PO drugs? IV. Right? When we talk about choosing the drugs for um, hypertensive crisis, generally, we're going to be doing uh, a combination of things. But generally, it's a calcium channel blocker with a vasodilator. Which calcium channel blockers are we going to use? Which ones are our calcium channel blockers? Nicardipine, clavidipine. Specifically because we can titrate them. We can adjust how much we are given in a uh, in a given time. The, in terms of vasodilators, nitroprusside, 
and then if for whatever reason we don't have access to nitroprusside or we don't want to use it, nitroglycerin. Why is nitroprusside preferred? Balanced vasodilator, exactly. The worst thing that can happen is that you dilate one half of the body and then allow the veins to just be full of pressure and then you really, really fuck up the body. Not good. Not good at all. The other option here is hydralazine. And then finally, our anti-adrenergic uh, drugs, which we are going to be using specifically to block the epi or norepi. So if for whatever reason someone like overdosed on uh, their SSRI uh, or, you know, they their clonidine for whatever reason, uh, they're in withdrawal, then we would want to use an anti-adrenergic. So this would be our beta blockers, our alpha blockers, all those sorts of guys. In terms of uh, drug choice, by uh, comorbidity. In terms of uh, aortic dissection, our uh, first line drugs is um, uh, first line is going to be our uh, beta blockers. Esmolol or labetalol. Adjunct is nitroprusside or nicardipine. you must give your beta blocker before the vasodilator. Why in aortic dissection do you have to give the beta blocker first? You have to slow the heart down. Also, uh, that's a very, very good point. Stopping the reflex tachycardia, right? The biggest thing here is that if you give the vasodilator, um, not only is their heart working so fast that it's ripping the heart apart, but then if you vasodilate, you're going to make that issue worse. So yes, your blood pressure is going to go down if you vasodilate, but the heart is going to speed up and then you know the tear that you have is going to get much, much worse. So you need to slow the heart and then dilate. In someone with AKI, right? So your blood pressure is so high, it is preventing the kidney from working. What drugs are we going to use? What is going to increase blood flow to the kidney? ACEs and ARBs are too slow. Those are oral. Although I like your thinking, ACEs and ARBs are nephroprotective, could be a good option. Dopamine? Yeah, totally. So your first line can be phenoldopam, right? D1 uh, dopamine agonist, it's going to widen the uh, blood vessels of the kidney. The other option is your clavidipine and your nicardipine. All of these are going to widen the uh, flow to the kidney. 
in terms of drugs that have to be avoided, we must avoid nitroprusside if kidney function is bad. And we also avoid esmolol and other beta blockers. Why do we not want nitroprusside? Exactly. This is going to cause cyanide toxicity. Normally, the kidney should be able to handle it. But if the kidney's an AKI, you're not going to be able to flush out all that cyanide. So you're going to be making them super, super toxic. With esmolol, uh, it doesn't, beta blockers have a meager effect in the kidney. So if you give esmolol, then you are uh, going to vasodilate in other places. And you know, you're watching the blood pressure come down. And you're like, oh, great, we're solving the issue, except in the kidney. So if someone has AKI, even though esmolol might be a good uh, option generally, uh, we want to avoid it in AKI because it's just not going to, it's going to look like we're solving the issue, but we really, really are not. Um, did she talk about, uh, we should really talk about pregnancy. Pregnancy. What was our drug of choice in high, in hypertension in, uh, Pregnancy? What was our drug of choice in hypertension in pregnancy? Beta law is close. Hydralazine, right? Hydralazine is our drug of choice in pregnancy. And this is a really, really good point to bring up. And I should have brought this up earlier. In hypertensive crisis or regular hypertension, this is extremely important. In pregnancy, you can never use, you cannot use ACEs, ARBs, uh, renin inhibitors. They're all contraindicated. All right. What that means is, is on the exam, if you have a pregnant patient, what is your first line drug? Diuretic and hydralazine. Diuretic and hydralazine. Do not give a pregnant patient an ACE or an ARB, right? If on the exam you were given a pregnant patient, I guarantee your go-to answer is going to want to be give them lisinopril. Do not give them lisinopril. Don't give them losartan. They will die. Well, their baby will die. We'll come out fucked up, actually. But that's the, the clinical word, come out fucked up. Any questions on... Uh, hypertension and hypertensive crisis. All right. Uh, tomorrow, uh, let me just double check what we have to go through. Oh, I said diuretics first, then uh, hydralazine. Yep.
I, I would love to teach there. I think teaching there would be a lot of fun. I just don't think I have the, you know, the long-term experience to really be able to do it. Um, tomorrow we will probably do, uh, we definitely have to do lipids, uh, which will also go into VTE. What is VTE? VTE. Oh, right. Thrombo. Okay, yes. Uh, da, da, da. We'll probably have to do lipids, which really isn't that bad. Uh, we'll do... All right. What I would say is tomorrow, go over erectile dysfunction and peripheral artery disease for yourself. Um, I'm not going to have time to be able to go through it. Um, but we're lipids, we can bang out really easy. CAD, we can bang out really easy. And VTE, we'll talk about as well, just because anything with clotting is going to take some time to talk about. All right, cool. Um, all right. Sweet. So I will see you tomorrow, 7 to 9. Don't be surprised if it actually goes something like 7 to 9.30 or 7 to 10. Um, just prepare for it ahead of time. But cool. All right. I will see you all later.